Hey guys, welcome to Reality TV. Welcome to a new theme song. Welcome to 2020. It feels really good to be back. I took two weeks off and just kind of, you know, regenerated. I still kept up on our 90 Day Fiance, which I want to talk about in just a second, even though we didn't have a new episode this week. But first, let me just thank Carol Ann, Renee, Melissa, Laura, and Melissa Mendoza for signing up for Patreon over the holidays. I know it's a tight time financially for everyone, so thank you extra much. I'm going to give you a rundown of a couple of things that happened over the holidays, but to give you an idea what's coming up this week on the show and this week on Patreon, you know, I'm only one person as much as I would like to talk about all the shows that I can. You know, you would have a two to three hour episode here on iTunes and it's pretty tough to get that edited and load it all up. So this week on this week's episode here, I'm going to be breaking down Sister Wives and Love After Lockup, Life After Lockup. And over on Patreon, I'm going to jump into the newest season of Married at First Sight. There are five couples this season. Pretty crazy. And I want to touch on one of my favorite shows, 60 Days In. If you don't watch the show, I don't know why you are not watching. It's amazing. You got to watch it. So I'll be talking about some of the newest contestants, I guess you would call it, on that show. Uh, That'll be over on Patreon this week. Now, because there's going to be a lot of new shows starting and a lot of our shows wrapping up, I'm talking about 90 Day Fiance that will be back this coming Sunday. Then in February, we're going to have Before the 90 Days, Sister Wives, Love After Lockup, Married at First Sight, maybe some 60 Days In, depending on how that's going to go down the season. Teen Mom, there's a lot. So I'm going to kind of rotate some of these shows, what's going to be on the main show, what's going to be on Patreon. And if you are a Patreon subscriber, don't worry. I'm not going to be doing just shows that you may or may not watch. I'm always going to be throwing in, you know, the normal episodes like we do, blind items, documentaries, all that kind of stuff. So that will not go away. It's just going to be kind of peppered in with some of our favorite shows here. Now, let's get into some of the crazy shit that went down over the holidays. First being, my kids got hoverboards. They actually paid for the hoverboards because I'm not going to be paying for that shit because I would not only be paying for the hoverboards, but I would be paying for a copay. My son used Christmas money that he had gotten from relatives, bought this, uh, I don't even know, it's like some knockoff hoverboard, the cheap one. Well, I decided that since I'm such a waif, I'm below the weight limit, I can do this. Jesus Christ, Like I damn near threw out my back. I absolutely triggered my sciatica. I'm like a thousand years old at this point. So there's that viral video. I'm sure you've seen it. It's like the lady gets on the hoverboard and there's some sort of like stick attachment to it. So it would almost be like a scooter hoverboard and she gets on it and somehow she rips the thing off and she is, there's no other way to describe her movement other than like tremoring vertically. And that is exactly what I looked like on my sons. Thank God one of my kids was there and I grabbed onto them. I mean, they're more resilient if they fall, they'll probably just bounce. So I grabbed onto one of them. It's no joke. You really have got to be careful on that thing. Somehow kids get a hang of it, probably because their center of gravity is lower to the floor than mine. But uh, they should definitely have a warning on the box. They probably did. But I, you know, threw it away quickly because my house is a freaking sty right now. All right. So I'm alive from the hoverboard incident. Oh, what else? Oh, Sasha from 90 Day Fiance. He's not a big fan of mine. All right. He might have seen the tweet where I called him a cyclops and that he missed leg day at the gym and uh, he didn't like it too much. So you can go and check that out. I stand by what I said. He should not be body shaming or outstaying his welcome at anyone's house. And yes, I get production told him to go and throw away the food. However, he still says within his tweets responding to people that he knows they'll come back and thank him someday or something like that. He's just trying to help. A little clue for those of you who think telling someone that they need to lose weight or get into shape is going to help them. It's not. I'm not even going to go into it because it's such an asinine train of thought. I can't even go there. But I did point out that the irony of him coming on Twitter and telling people that they don't really know him and they don't know the whole situation and not to judge him is that he himself is 
judging his sister-in-law, his wife, and all of us, really. So, hey, pot, me kettle. Uh, Okay, Tanya from 90 Day Fiance. Yeah, I'm not done talking about 90 Day Fiance, even though there wasn't an episode this week. So over the past two weeks when there wasn't or were episodes on TV, I called up my sister who lived in Costa Rica 20 years, something like that. And I told her to watch the episode. Let me know what she thought, first of all, of this whole Costa Rica scenario and also where she thought Tanya was staying. She nailed it down within like the first 30 seconds of watching her. So this place, and of course it's escaping my mind, it's something like Honey Ginger, Honey Badger, Ginger Creek, I don't know, something like that. You can go check out on Twitter, Instagram, and our Facebook, our closed Facebook group, the Reality TV Orchard of Snark. You can go click on the links there and you can see for yourself what kind of courses they offer, which is what leads me to this big point. This place that Tanya was staying at, it's on the Atlantic side of Costa Rica, or if you are geographically inclined like I am, it's on the right side. So this place is kind of, well, it's not a school, traditional school. It's kind of like a retreat place where you can pick and choose the types of classes and courses that you want. I don't think you would really get like a, well, you might get like a certificate, but it's not as if you are getting accredited courses that you are then going to transfer to, I don't know, the University of Kentucky or wherever the hell. So basically what it looks like for a fact Tanya did in some variation of this was that either a tour manager or Tanya herself and some friends just rented these nearby cabins that you can rent, these little bungalows. And then you could just be like, oh, I kind of want to take some of these courses, some of that. And they'll put it together in a little package for you. Uh, Did I mention you can take all these courses online Yeah, you can. Not only can you take them online remotely, but you can also organize and just tell them when you want to come. Now, you might have to like wait a month or wait a year so that they can get enough people to take it at one time because, I mean, listen, they're going to take your money one way or another. They're not going to be turning people away. Go and check it out. You'll see what I'm saying. So Tanya could have gone, I think I saw some packages starting March 2020, January 2020, plenty of time for her to do her flower course, her flower oil course at a later date, or she could have done it online. Tanya wanted a vacation. Bottom line, it just confirms what we already knew. She's an asshole. Okay, moving on. Oh, things I watched over the two-week break. I dove into Netflix, Don't Fuck With Cats. I had no idea what it was before I jumped into it. I was just desperate to find some sort of newer documentary because I think I've seen basically every documentary on Netflix and Hulu. So I started watching it and I mean, it is a little graphic. It's not as graphic as it could be, of course. I covered my eyes most of it and then I just told Dave, like he has to give me a signal because I plug my ears and then I tell him to like to wave when I can finally look and listen and he never listens. So then like five minutes later, I'm like, is it over? And he's like, yeah, it has been over. (sighs) Marriage, it's always so fun. Anyhow, I liked the true crime aspect of it. Of course, I didn't like the cat killing part of it. But the end, that last scene I'm going to spoil it for you. So if you are planning on watching the documentary, jump ahead. I don't know, 10 to who knows, fucking three minutes the way that I talk. At least 30 seconds. All right. So the last scene of the last episode, we have the woman. What is it? Body motion, body moving, whatever. It turns into this, I don't know, very meta moment where she looks at the camera and she's like, did we contribute to this? Did we give him attention or is it? And she like pans to the right and looks in the camera or is it you who's watching this right now? And I was like, wait, oh God, now we're doing this like artsy fartsy shit where now it's turning around on me. That alone turned me off. I mean, if the killing cat thing, all right, that did it too. But that and that alone, if I knew it was going to end with that sort of twist or life-changing moment and we're supposed to think about it now. I don't want to be fucking thinking. I want to solve a crime, sure, but I don't want to be like thinking about my own thinking, if that makes any sort of sense. So it was not a big fan of that ending. Oh, what else did I watch? Oh, okay. So I'm always looking for documentaries that my kids can watch with me because I want to be able to enjoy it too. I'm not watching fucking Air Bud or anything like that. 
So I went through the Amazon Prime list and I went through all of the like Manor House, Victorian Slum House. I know it sounds so stupid, but you guys, I'm telling you, they're really good. Way back when it had been 15 to 20 years ago, there was a series on WTTW, PBS, and it was Frontier House where they take people now and then they have to go live for like, I don't know, six months or a year during that time frame. I think there was a 14, no, it wasn't 1492. It was like Revolutionary War era or some, I don't know, whatever. Go and look into it. Some of them are on Amazon Prime. There's like a Canadian version of Frontier House. I forgot what it's called. Anyhow, as I was going through there, something triggered my memory. And I was like, I wonder if that show called The Mole is anywhere to be found. This goes like real deep. Anderson Cooper was the host of this show. I remember it was on CBS, I believe. It had like all the elements of the amazing race, but one of the people in the group of contestants, let's say there's like 10 contestants, one of them is the mole. And the mole's job is to sabotage not all of the challenges, but some of the challenges so that the group as a whole does not get as much money in the pot, because then at the end, the winner gets the pot. And then at each episode's end, everyone has to take the quiz and they have to guess who the mole is. And then they get eliminated based on how many questions they got correct and incorrect. And there was even a season of Celebrity Mole. And I'm not going to tell you who the mole was if you're going to go back and watch it. Actually, there might have been two seasons of the Celebrity Mole. So I found seasons one, two, and three, and we started watching it I mean, this is pre-HD TV, so we didn't watch them all in a row because my kids are absolutely spoiled and they're like, why is it fuzzy? It's not zooming in enough. They need to pick up the pace. And they're right. The editing's not great, but it's a great show. So if you're looking for something, not even if you, you know, if you don't have kids, you're still going to enjoy this. Some of these throwback shows are amazing. And actually, this is a perfect segue to talk about Total Request Podcast. Amanda and I this week, we are going to watch an episode of Pen15, I believe. If you are not signed up for Total Request Podcast, that's at patreon.com slash Amanda and Jody. I'll put the link in the show notes. You can request any throwback show, any current show, The latest episode that we just released of Sister Wives, we recapped the wedding of Tony and McKelty, and I went back and listened to it, and I never do that, and it is so fucking funny because Amanda has never watched Sister Wives, and her take on everything and Christine singing cracked my ass up. So go and check that out. And, you know, speaking of Sister Wives, I was going to do Love After Lockup first, but let's jump in. The Sister Wives Pond. Oh, dear God. And let's just get right into it. You guys know me, and you know I'd rather have a vanilla glaze long john donut than a kale and beet smoothie. I do the best I can and I work out, but it is really hard. Even the best food trackers and whole food shoppers are probably like me, struggling to get all the essential nutrients I need in my body on a daily basis. So here's where I started researching Ritual. Ritual is the obsessively researched vitamin for women, and uh, I wouldn't know anything about being obsessed with anything. So weird. Um, really though. Ritual is all over their product and they have thought of everything. I will be honest, I take all of my prescriptions and vitamins in the morning because I have them right next to my Keurig machine so I don't forget. I also still do my intermittent fasting and what is awesome about Ritual is that you can take it on an empty stomach. I have never been able to do that before without getting a nasty aftertaste, you know that fishy taste in your mouth. It's the worst. Also, if you work out on an empty stomach like I do, you don't get that gross after taste. I'm not going to make you sick even thinking about it. But Ritual doesn't use fish oil, so I've never had this happen. I used to have to split up all my vitamins. I would have to take my omega-3s at night because of that stomach issue. But now I just pop it in the morning. I don't even have to think about it. And there's this little peppermint tab in the bottle. It just keeps everything staying naturally fresh. And the capsule is super cool looking. (laughs) I'll post a picture of it. It's almost futuristic or something. Makes me feel like I'm a hip millennial until, you know, I look around and remember that 
that I was around when scrunchies were cool before you were a Visco girl. So here's what you need to do to start your subscription today. It's only a dollar a day and you can snooze your subscription at any time. No strings attached. Better health doesn't happen overnight. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Fill in those gaps in your diet with Essential for Women, a small step that helps support a healthy foundation for your body. Visit ritual.com slash realityv to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash realityv. Holy flashbacks. Before we even get to the new opening montage, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, we get a few minutes, actually, of flashbacks of the last, what, 10 years. We see Robin pre-Cody, pre-King Solomon and little Areola. We have Mary when her hair was straight, like pre-flat iron, flippy wave things. She still had that green army green coat with like the ruffles. You know what I'm talking about? It was amazing. Loved the walk down memory lane. And Christine, I mean, when you compare Christine then to now, she has done an amazing 180. Christine, love her. And I think I'm going to love her this season, especially if maybe, fingers crossed, she tackles Mary down in that pond like she did in that park two, three seasons ago. Okay, now this opening montage I was not expecting that. We've had that same opening, little variations of it. I think they did a little update with different outfits. But there's always like that, we all want to do this. Sister Wives makes us better. But no, no, no longer. It's just a silent, close-up, like very Olin Mills, you know, where you're like, you're looking at the camera and then that little picture where it's your profile. Yeah, each of them get their own. It's really kind of eerie. All right, so right off the bat, we're in Flagstaff. We're off to a running start, actually running, because there's a kid on a leash. (laughs) You guys, someone's got to call Nicole in uh, Bradington, Bradington, Florida. Nicole from 90 Day Fiance. They might have run away to the Browns. Or, I don't know, maybe that's that's too far-fetched, right? I mean, they have iPads, but I didn't see this little one with an iPad, so it must be... Well, it can't be Truly, unless Truly, oh, maybe Truly did do something to Ariola because Truly does want to be the youngest one. Okay, now I'm getting mean. I'm not going to make fun of the kids, but I will make a stand. Okay, I am pro free walking children. I'm all right. I'm anti-leash. I'm pro vaccination, anti-leash. I just think if you are going to use a leash, let's say you're pro leash, we can all be we can all be friends no matter our leash stance. I don't think you need a leash when you are in your own cul-de-sac or in your own driveway. Maybe it's a crowded city. Maybe you're at the zoo or something and you don't want little maybe truly climbing into the orangutan thing. Anyhow, I don't think that Robin's niece needed to have Ariola on the leash and she was like spinning in circles. Little... Ariola, little nippy, was whipping that niece around and she was being strong armed then. Like, you gotta be careful if you are gonna leash a kid. I saw that woman choke up on the leash at least three times before I was distracted by Mary because, I mean, when Mary comes into a scene, she demands all the attention. So my attention went from backpack leash to Mary. And then I got a little distracted. I had to pause my sister wives, go down the LuLaRoe Google hole, because I had to Google whether LuLaRoe makes any solids, because Mary was not wearing any dizzying prints. And by the way, I didn't see any solids. Maybe I didn't go deep enough, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, more on Lacey and Shane later. (laughs) All right, so basically, back to the Browns, we get a moving update. They're in Flagstaff. It is downpouring. So they're all just scrambling to get boxes into whoever's houses that they can be at. Now, unlike Vegas, the Browns are all over the city of Flagstaff. They loved that aerial drone footage, didn't they? I think they showed that map at least four or five times. Like, we get it. We don't need to see exactly. Well, maybe we do need to see exactly where we're turning left and right, because if any of you live in the area of Flagstaff, 
guess who's coming to stay with you? It's going to be me because we're going to go and stock down these houses, which is why that neighbor might have gone crazy. More on that in a second. Okay, so they're all over the city. They're not in Cody's sack. Uh, Speaking of Cody, he has definitely been working on his tendrils. And I don't know if it's that curly girl method that I've been hearing about or just thousands of dollars in deep conditioning treatments, but it is looking, I'm not going to say good, it's looking healthier. We have to give him credit where credit's due. Now, we all know if he just like cut it all off, he would look so much better. He might even look handsome. I'm not saying hot. I'm not saying I'm attracted to him. But if he took it all off, we can all agree it would look better than it does now. Now, actually, you know what? Speaking of Cody and his hair, there was one point where they did a flashback photo. It might have been when they were talking about when it was just Mary and Cody. And Cody, young Cody, looks exactly like current day Gabe, son of Janelle, the one who's been having issues with moving and all that. Wow. Sorry, Gabe. Or or maybe, you know what? Cody looked better then. So good for Gabe. Either way, Cody looked better pre-Mary, pre-marrying and pre-Mary. All right. Now, speaking of Mary, she hijacks this move at Janelle's house. And I was pretty pissed. I don't even understand the logic in this because she says, well, let's go move into my house. You can back right up to the garage. It's raining and we should get all my shit in because I have zero kids and no one but me who needs a bed to sleep in tonight. Like, I just don't get that. Mary is the worst. For all those of you who have never watched Sister Wives before, we don't like Mary. Even if it was pouring rain, couldn't Mary have held up a tarp, held up one of her LuLaRoe shirts or something, use that as a tarp to get Janelle and her five kids into the house that they have a place to sleep? No, no, we got to go to Mary's house. Now, there's all this drama about Mary's rental home. She's renting it. She leased the house, which is, I mean, straight out of 1990 Architectural Digest. And, you know, it didn't seem that, uh, I don't know, attractive or perfect for Mary or for myself. I mean, there was definitely no wet bar there. But on the night she moves in, we learn that there's this neighbor that came over. This is not on camera. Came over to Mary and Cody, and the neighbor was pretty pissed. Now, I am not totally convinced it's because they're polygamists. You know, maybe the neighbor just doesn't like creepy husband-wife duos that have matching crispy orange skin and Doc Brown from Back to the Future hair. But in any event, this landlord decides that she's going to terminate the lease with Mary. She doesn't want to upset the neighborhood. I am going to say I think this went perfectly to Mary's plan because, as always, she gets to cry victim and run back to Vegas away from the family, which is exactly what ended up happening. Now, I do think the neighbors were probably assholes, but again, I don't think it was actually because they were polygamous. Let's just take a minute to think about this. They are in a Col de Cody sack, And if you have a house on the block, especially looked like it was like the house dead and, you know, if you were going to go straight into the cul-de-sac, maybe the neighbors were not liking that a camera crew was there probably setting up early in the morning or was there till whenever they can shut down. I don't know what the normal filming time is, but not only are you going to be having a crew with vans and trucks coming in, probably Mary, if she's still selling all this shitty clothes. I'm sorry. I'm not a fan of LuLaRoe. If you are, uh, bless your heart. But if she's got like all these shipments and stuff coming in, maybe they don't like all the boxes coming in and out. They don't like the camera crew. And not only that, they're going to have assholes like me. They're going to be going to look for the house and driving through the sack all the time. So maybe that's what they were upset about. Not necessarily their belief system in polygamy. But in the end, Mary does find some place that she's going to rent in Flagstaff, but it's going to be a couple months. So she is back very lonely in the cul-de-sac. I don't think she's really lonely. I think she is living it up and loving every second of it. All right. Now, my personal favorite wife, Christine, what is going on with her? She found a house, but they couldn't close on it right away. But today is finally moving day, and we see that Christine and Cody are making the third level, the penthouse, if you will. It's supposed to be the family room because there's like a big fireplace, huge windows, amazing views. 
while these two lovebirds are going to make it their master bedroom, which further proves the fact in my mind that these two are still the horniest for each other. I am telling you, every molecule in my body knows that Christine and Cody get down. And Amanda and I, when we recapped uh, McConey's, McConey's, McKelty and Tony's wedding for Total Request podcast, we were watching Christine and Cody twirl around that dance floor and It just reaffirmed my belief that those two are probably the healthiest relationship on all of TLC that I can think about at this moment, which is really just these four marriages. Uh, Okay, so moving on. Oh, I don't know why it never occurred to me when I was watching this show for however many years before. There's always a takeaway moment where it's just Cody on the couch. None of the wives are there. And whenever they have him on the couch, they zoom in an extreme close up and it gets very serious. Cody gets um, flummoxed. He's wondering things. He's trying to come up with analogies, kind of like I am now. And this week's serious moment brought to you by Cody is all about finances. All the wives and Cody then gather around Robin's ultra modern, minimalistic dining room that seems fully furnished. And they're discussing the status of their four mortgages on Las Vegas homes, which I don't know if I said this, they haven't sold them at this point. Actually, does anyone know if they're still on the market? I thought at least one or two of them sold their house. Anyhow, so at this point, at least, they had the four mortgages on the Vegas homes. They have the mortgage on the land that's just sitting there. They haven't built on it. They have the three rental homes, Robin's, Janelle's, and what, Christine's? Okay, well, whatever. They have the homes in Vegas. They have all the rentals. And now Christine is going to be getting a mortgage because she moved into and bought that house. Now, this does beg the question, where, even if they sell the homes, where are they getting all this money to pay the new mortgages, the land, the rentals? What is going on? Because I don't think my sister wife's closet is killing it. Janelle, obviously, is not that great of a realtor if she can't even sell their own homes. Mary's LuLaRoe, I bet you she's stashing away all her money for herself and her bed and breakfast. Remember, I found out that she doesn't have a mortgage for a business to be run there. Who knows whether she's actually renting anything out. I think the website is still live, but there's plenty of available dates. Let's just put it that way. Where are they making money? I mean, I get it. They're making money from the show, but that's not enough long term, right? Unless they're paying off one or two of the houses in cash. It just really makes you wonder how much longer they can make it just from the show. Maybe something needs to go down. Maybe truly gets into true crime. I mean, I can see it happening. Okay, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I'm going to have like the truly beehive go at me in my reviews on iTunes. I better just move away from that. Uh, Okay, so let's just get to the pond, shall we? The reason why we are all here, Coyote Pass. The family is trying to make Janelle's son Gabe love Flagstaff, so they bring him to this land that they bought because he's the only one that hasn't seen it. So they show up, and Gabe loves the view of the mountain, and then he gets turned around and pointed in the direction of this pond. This thing is not a pond. I repeat, it is not a pond. This thing is a ditch where builders dig a huge pit. Okay, those of you who have built homes or moved into a new subdivision, you know what I'm talking about. Whenever they're building or clearing land to later build on, they dig a huge pit and then they backhoe all the topsoil from all the surrounding land that you're purchasing and that you're planning to build on into, it will look like a big mountain or a big hill. Stay with me here. That big hill later becomes the island that they're all looking at in this pond. I know you thought I was just a geography genius. I'm also really into geology or dirt or whatever the science of a topsoil turning into a pond thing is. All right. So stay with me here. This is going to sound weird, but they backhoe all of this topsoil into this big hill mountain area. Well, because it's just topsoil, as soon as it starts raining, topsoil is not like 
the first, second, third layer of dirt. Very technical here. Okay, it sinks really quickly. And then that big mountain becomes a big ditch. Remember, they built a ditch. The people dig a ditch ahead of time and they put the topsoil. So anyhow, the topsoil just like sinks and eventually it becomes a giant pond or lake if it sits there long enough. I backed up to one of these things for far too long, like 10 years during the housing bust. I know how this thing goes. Like I saw it happen over the course of 10 years. All right. Something that is like three stories high will sink down below ground surface and fill with water. That is what they were swimming in. It is not a pond. It's not a lake. It is just filth, water, sewage. They're fucking idiots. No way in hell would I allow my kids to even touch that kind of water, let alone get in there. And I'll be totally honest here. I just told you that I backed up to this. I'm sure if you Google my name, you can like find these very embarrassing records. But I pulled an Anne from Parks and Rec where I used to live. I went to the village board meetings to speak on public time. And it's probably in some sort of record or whatever. I had people sign petitions. I was outraged at this ditch left by builders during, whatever, 2009, because it's a public nuisance and danger. But what do the Browns do? They fucking jump into theirs, and they think there's probably, like, fish in there. You know why? That's why Cody jumped in. He probably wanted to, like, pull out a bass. Now, Cody can never be outshined by his kids, right? So Cody himself strips down to his black fruit of the loom brief bikinis and runs into shit water. Now, I can see Gabe doing it. I can see the kids doing it. I don't approve. I don't contone of it. But you know what? They're kids. Did I just say contone? I'm channeling Tony again. Tony. Tony does not contone. Cody, however, is an adult, but he can't be outdone. He's got to get in there. He's got to steal his kid's thunder. So he gets down into these little bikinis. I mean, there was some high cut on those thighs. He's screaming, it's probably cold. How cold is it? Mm, Sure. We all know what you're doing, Cody. You're throwing it out there so that we're like, oh, he's probably going to have shrinkage. So when we see nothing, we're like, oh, Cody really is packing something, but it's just because it's cold. Sure, Cody. And as a matter of fact... (laughs) Let's talk about this blur. You know, some of you were asking me, I had a bunch of DMs that were like, why do you think they blurred it? And, you know, people talking on Twitter, there was a blur. Why do they blur it out if he's wearing underwear? I don't think that we can just dismiss the fact that maybe Cody is just blurred down there. (laughs) Maybe he just has a natural blur. Much like I think David from 90 Day Fiance of David and Annie, I think I don't think there's any boom, boom going on. You know, people who talk about it don't really do it as much. I think David's penis has been reabsorbed. I think he has a reabsorbed penis. It just went all back in. It, it's not like an any or it got smaller. I can't believe I'm talking this much about David's penis. It's just been reabsorbed into like the surrounding area, his his uh, space. So Cody might just have a blur. But let's talk about this a little bit more. You know, I don't remember a time when my dad stripped down his underwear and was dying to swim in a pond with us, bathe in our own land, if you will. But here we have Cody, who is just dying to have that daddy kid moment, you know, where you're all stripped down and you're wanting to take pictures in your underwear together. Don't you guys all do this? No? No? Yeah. He's got to stop. He emerges from the water in his underwear that he's trying to pretend like, I don't want anyone to see me. Well, then don't stand up. Be like any mom in a pool who doesn't want to be seen, where you go in. You're not standing on the edge of the pool. No. You go in, you sit down, or you stand to where the water hits you at the height wherever you're comfortable. Like for me, I love to get into my shoulders because if I go water below my boobs and my boobs float and they're big and it's like a whole thing, all right? What I'm trying to say is Cody doesn't mind. He wants to be seen. Where was I? Oh, okay. So 
Cody's loving every minute of it. All of my ovaries. Yeah, I have many. I got more than one ovary, not to like brag, but they were cringing. Like they just shriveled up like a fucking raisin. Disgusting. Which begs the question, I mean, how does Christine and Cody... No, I'm sticking to it. They love each other. They have a lot of sex. Where am I going with this? Now I'm kind of disgusted with myself that I'm thinking about Cody in his underwear so much and I can't get it out of my brain. This is like a whole moment. I'm having a don't fuck with cats moment where I'm thinking about my thinking. Thank you, body moving. Now I'm getting all meta on myself. Anyhow, uh, this season coming up, you guys, it looks really, really good. If you are new to the show and you watch this episode and you're like, wait a second, I thought this was supposed to be good. It is going to get better. Just look at the previews. The fact that Mary is yelling at anyone is talking back to Robin and Robin is getting salty. This is really good. And that Cody admits that they don't sleep in the same bed together, that he thinks Mary is not a victim, like he's thinking like the rest of us. This season to be so good. I mean, what else can top him calling Mary on her bullshit? Probably calling truly on her bullshit. Okay, I didn't say that. God, did someone just walk in here? Whew. All right, I'm going to take a quick break, have a word from my sponsor this week, and then I'll be back with Love After Lockup. I remember New Year's Eve 2007 vividly. I desperately wanted to get pregnant in 2008, and what I needed at the time and didn't know about was modern fertility. You know, I had all the fertility planning books, the basal thermometer, the whole thing. But what I remember the most about that time was that it was all wait and see. You know, are my luteal phases normal? Maybe my egg supply is low. What are my chances of getting pregnant next month? Fast forward a few years, and I was crossing my fingers and praying the other way that I would not get pregnant again. Common denominator in all of this, like all of us women on the planet, I had no idea what was going on with my fertility without going to an OBGYN or specialist. This is why I love modern fertility and why I am now able to easily track my fertility and hormones. Without having to get my insurance card and benefits out to see what my plan covers, I can get all the information I need. You know, who wants to go see what they've spent on their deductible? All that stuff sucks when you're a grown up. Now, don't think modern fertility is just for middle aged, fabulous women like myself. Whether you are trying to prevent pregnancy or wanting to see if menopause is on the horizon, Modern Fertility was created for all of us. I just did the simple and painless finger prick at home, mailed it in the prepaid package, and 10 days later, I had all of my results in my inbox. These tests can cost you well over $1,000, but Modern Fertility is only $159, and you can use your HSA or FSA. Plus, I'm going to tell you how to save 20 bucks off your fertility test at modernfertility.com. I want to be in charge of my body and my health, and I want you to be empowered too. Right now, Modern Fertility is offering my listeners $20 off the test when you go to modernfertility.com slash realitv. That's R-E-A-L-I-T-V. That means your test will only cost $139 instead of the hundreds or thousands it could cost at a doctor's office. Get $20 off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com slash realitv. Modernfertility.com slash reality tv love after lockup is back and better than ever now i actually enjoyed last season of love after lockup it got a lot of shit if you look at reviews and social media i really liked it but i love trash tv now life after lockup i was kind of unimpressed the last go around but this season has got some potential minus the sarah michael megan drama because i'm over it Ooh, oh, hold on. Hot off the press, you guys. My son's gastroenterologist. I don't even know how to say it. New year and new test results look amazing. This is great. Those of you who have been following my journey with my kid and his illness and uh, the shit, the literal shit I had to deliver to the hospital last week. Things are looking up for the Huff family. All right, that was, uh, well, I guess I'm talking about my kids' shit and I'm talking about shit TV. So let's just dive right into it. Let's start with Tony and Angela. Sorry, those of you who don't have children are probably just like vomiting everywhere right now. But listen, parenthood, the joys. All right, Tony and Angela. Thank God these two don't have any kids. Can you imagine Angela's eggs? Like, I feel like that kid would come out just reeking of tobacco tobacco and maybe he would be one of those babies that's born with like a full set of teeth, just a snaggle tooth, stinks so bad they won't even put him in the nursery. Where am I going with this? 
<laughs> now I feel bad that I hurt this made-up baby's feelings. Oh, don't hate me, made-up baby Angela baby and truly stands. All right, let's get into this before I get myself in a lot of trouble. Tony was doing a whole damn lot. So Ange is burning all the letters that Tony wrote to her and a t-shirt because that's all he's got. And after Angela invites these producers into her office kitchen, we learn that Tony was helping prostitutes run their business by renting motel rooms for free in exchange for sex. I mean, that's obvious. Now, how did Angela get into Tony's phone? How did she see all these text messages? Well, she pulled some like FBI level shit and got the SIM card out and then popped it into her phone. Is this a thing? I mean, I barely know how to work my Bluetooth and where I'm playing things into, whether it's the TV. Apparently, there's something called AirPlay, you guys, that Dave and my kids were teaching me about. You can shoot up from your phone or your computer to the TV. It's like a whole thing. Angela apparently works for fucking Apple, and she knows all the tricks like this. I mean, what's she doing in that trailer working as a mental health therapist when she could be over in the freaking Ukraine and we can figure out who tapped what phone and who was saying what? Angela, get your shit together, man. Get on that motorcycle, get yourself to D.C., and get yourself a nice government job. Oh, my God. I mean, what I would give to see Angela actually learn how to hack into shit like that, and then she'd be testifying in front of Adam Schiff in front of a congressional hearing. That would be like a dream come true. I would probably start going to church again being like, wow, there really is a man up in the sky that's listening to all my wishes and my prayers. Oh, Angela with her snaggle tooth sitting there. She wouldn't be able to hold off, though. That would be a reason why Angela wouldn't testify. It wouldn't be because she was trying to, you know, hide the truth or stick up for Democrats or Republicans. It would be because she could not not smoke. Like, they would have to take breaks every 30 seconds for her, right? How many packs of cigarettes do you think she goes through in a day? I'm not a smoker, so I don't even have a concept. How many cigarettes come in a pack? Like, 12 or like 20? Because in one scene, she had three cigarettes, but she's also not using all of them either. In her ashtray, there's like lots of half of them. Is that do you only smoke it down to a half? Where am I going with this? Let's get back to Tony. Jesus, I'm this is what happens when I take a two week break. I don't speak to anyone in my family about this stuff. So I get here and it's just bleh, verbal diarrhea. Speaking of diarrhea, I'm sure Tony has it because he comes home and Angela's about to kill him. So he comes in, and I mean, if we didn't already know Tony was a con and a schmooze and a liar, that buttoned up to the top, you know what I'm talking about, that shirt that he's wearing, where it's not the type of shirt that you're supposed to even button the top button, that is a dead giveaway. If a guy is wearing a shirt like that, he's either a liar, a creep, or he's about to fucking rob you. Something is very weird about that. And Tony, despite the fact that he gained some weight and I would say he's just like an average looking guy and nothing against like gaining weight. I actually like a chubbier guy. Tony's too confident. That goes along with the whole sociopath thing. He thinks he's more attractive than he is. He thinks he's smarter than he is. And he thinks that he can still con Angela into believing that he was only flirting with the prostitutes that he was texting. And if you paused and zoomed in on the text, it said something like, I'll sign you in under an assumed name and then I'll come up and play. Oh, I don't want to hear any guy saying he's going to play with me. If Dave was like, I'm going to come up and play with you, I'd be like, well, you might as well bring the divorce papers with you because the only playing I want to do is maybe telling my kids to go play Fortnite somewhere else. I'll play a board game every now and then, but I'm beyond playing. I I'm past that even sexually. <laughs> All right. So yeah, Tony is uh, like the Robert Herjavec on Shark Tank of the motel strip. Okay. He's an entrepreneur. He's an investor. He's just helping the prostitutes with their business. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I sensed a lot of overacting on both their parts during this scene. Just something didn't feel 
authentic. Like either they fought before and they were asked to reenact the whole thing, which would be really bizarre and a strange thing to ask, or Tony and Angela planned this fight because they know that they have to stay on the show. They got to bring something to it. So what better way than stage some arguments or even if it's a legit argument, something that actually happened, they're going to play it up. Because later, of course, they get back together and they show them sitting in front of Angela's chateau emphasis on the chat, cheersing their Andre champagne and their sparkling grape juice. These two need a paycheck and I just think we need to be very careful what we believe and what we don't believe with these two. All right, moving on to Megan, Michael, and Sarah. They are just boring. It's been done before. We've seen this all before. But very quickly, Michael's in Texas to surprise Megan. But before we even get to Megan's house and see her in her newest wrap dress, because that's all we ever see her wearing now, we hear Michael talking to another woman who is neither Sarah nor Megan. Shocking. Now, he gets to Megan's house and he says that he wants to be with Megan, which, of course, is not sincere because he just got busted. And then we have freaking Megan, who looks great, but she's stupid. She let the fame get to her head and now she's just living in it. She's so jaded by the fame of Love After Lockup that she's a 30-year-old woman living at home and now... It says that she's a singer. I don't know if we knew that or not before. Pretty sure it used to say student, which brings me to my second point. Do we know that she was 30 years old? I don't know why in my mind I'm thinking Megan's like 23, 24. Michael is maybe 24, 25, 28 and 30. Get your shit together, both of you. And Megan's dad seems pretty with it. Like, shouldn't she know how a healthy relationship works? She's just stupid. Uh, Looks great, but she's stupid. So let's jump over to Sarah. Same thing. She looks better, although I hate the hoop earrings that are like, what would you say? It was probably like six inches in diameter. It goes all the way across, right? Six inches in diameter. Let's figure out the circumference while we're at it. Uh, She's disappointed that Michael isn't there to parent their daughters with her. So she ends up playing this really sad and strange telephone game with aviary, aviary, Aviara, Aviana, Aviana, that's what it is. Um, And then they have this scary stare down between Aviana and Sarah right at the end. What the fuck was that? It scared me. I got actual chills. It gave me Sophia Abraham vibes, which I don't like to put that out there because I actually think Aviana or both of Sarah's kids are absolutely adorable. Not as cute as Brianna from Teen Moms Girls. Never will Nova or Stella be outdone. They're the cutest, but these two are very cute. But Aviana, staring at her mom, I got Sophia Abraham vibes. Now we go back to Texas and Megan's friend who we've met before, he meets up with Tweedle Dumb and Dumber because he probably just wanted some free drinks and he knew production would pay for it. And it's all of them just trying to extend their 15 minutes of fame. I mean, I'd rather see what's going on with Jonna and Garrett if we needed some time filler rather than this thruple. All right, moving on to Brittany and Marcelino. Well, Brittany's pregnant again, which was a surprise because she was on some sort of birth control. One of the implants, whatever it is, it, she was supposed to not be able to get pregnant for 10 years, but she did. And really, there's nothing to say because Brittany and Marcelino, in comparison to everyone else, they're pretty normal. I've always liked Brittany. I thought she probably had a really hard upbringing, a really tough childhood. And so she made some really shitty decisions, but she kind of has that old soul, wise beyond her year thing going on. So I was thrilled to hear that her son is in her full custody. Her daughter, I don't remember if they showed her in this scene or not, but Anyhow, they're doing well. She's pregnant again. They seem to get along. They seem to love each other. Obviously, there's going to be some highs and lows because we saw her at one point in the previews throw a glass on the floor and she's going to get upset with his drinking. I really hope it's that they just have to have something for the cameras because I want the best for Brittany. I don't know why. She looks better than ever. Her hair looks great. Her makeup looks great. I just want the best for them because they're a boring, normal-ish couple. All right, Andrea and Lamar. Well, Andrea is definitely far from normal. She drives me 
fucking nuts. I would move to L.A. too if I were Lamar. So Lamar is in Los Angeles. Even though they're still married, she wants to stay in Utah with her kids because she thinks it's best for her kids. And he never had any intention of leaving Los Angeles. So that's where he's at. Now, according to Andrea, who her friends sometimes call her Andrea, by the way, so I'm going to use it interchangeably too. According to Andrea, Andrea, he's a great dad, but a crappy husband. But the reason she's not divorcing him is because her kids will be missing out on some things. Hmm, like a parent who wears shoes whilst running across a highway. No, 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 no. Crazy Jody. At least one of them is going to be missing out on their biological father because, plot twist, Andrea has been keeping a secret. What? No. Andrea? You mean the one who kept Lamar a secret? The one who planned a move out of state a secret? The one who planned to hold Lamar hostage in Utah? No. So unlike Andrea. I mean, such an honest Mormon woman. Yeah. Well, turns out Andrea's youngest daughter is really Lamar's. Well, how does that happen? Well, Andrea fills in her friends, even the one with the Moana necklace that stuck through her ears, that she paid for some closet time while she was visiting Lamar in prison, which means uh, let's start tallying up these lies and secrets here. Remember when they went through the car wash and Andrea said that that was their first time together? She was so nervous about what it was going to be like. Yeah, well, the car wash was not the first time that Lamar checked under Andrea's undercarriage, if you know what I'm saying. Now, we know she's a liar. Let's walk through this because I am questioning. I'm just going to put it out there. I don't think her youngest daughter is actually Lamar's. I want a Maury Povich, let's go get the DNA test. Because when she said, I forgot the youngest daughter's name, uh, God, Priscilla. When she said Priscilla is Lamar's, I would think that all of her friends, if this were my friend saying this, I'd be like, well, what about John? I mean, at some point when she said, I'm pregnant this last time with Priscilla, people had to have known or had an idea who the dad was, and no one even knew about Lamar. So what if that person, let's call him John, her ex, whoever Priscilla's maybe dad is, let's say that is the dad, and now... Andrea is lying again, saying Lamar is her father so that Lamar will come back. I mean, she is a liar. Anything is possible. So now I'm questioning which lie is really the truth. Was it the first time around when she was saying that her ex was Priscilla's dad? Or is the lie that Lamar is the dad? You see what I'm saying? I almost think it makes more sense that the ex would be the dad and Lamar wouldn't. But she was telling Lamar... Yeah, I got pregnant that one time in the closet, and that's your daughter. Hmm, she's a liar. I don't trust anything that comes out of Andrea's mouth. All right, moving on to Lacey and Shane, the bells of the ball. I'm sorry, it never gets old. Prison Mike. Are you nervous? God, Lacey's freaking voice. Ugh. Well, if she was talking to me, I would say, yes, Lacey, I am nervous that your elastic top is just going to start to roll down like Spanx do off of anyone that is not a size zero. Yeah, we're very nervous. So Lacey and Shane are at this OB or RE, some kind of specialist office, and already I can tell that Shane is super psyched. Not for the same reason that Lacey thinks he's psyched, though. <laughs> Lacey wants to get her tubes retied, but Shane is excited because he's at the mental age of, oh, I was going to say 13, but I'm going to say like 14 and a half year old boy. Shane is excited because he thinks he's cool because he's at like a girl part doctor and he thinks everyone's looking at him like, wow, that guy's really cool. He has sex. It makes him feel extra special. He's a big boy now. Now they go back to this office and enter my child development teacher from high school. They've got to be related. And yes, I see the Sally Jesse Raphael comparison, but I'm telling you, I'm going to have to find a picture, get out my old yearbook or something, because I was having flashbacks of carrying my flower baby around. So obviously I was in deep with this scene. I was feeling very connected. 
as deep as Lacey will allow, <laughs> if you catch my drift. Well, Dr. Hoozy What's It explains Lacey's tubes like she's talking to a kindergartner because, well, I mean, she's talking to Lacey and Shane. They can make some bunny ears with Lacey's tubes and tie them back together, bunny ear through the hole, or they can do IVF. Now, Shane hears IVF and he's like, uh, is The Rock going to be there? Hulk Hogan's my favorite. No, 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 Shane, not WWF, IVF. They can take fresh or frozen sperm. (laughs) She said sperm. Fresh or frozen eggs. (laughs) <laughs> Scrambled my favorite. And they can even store frozen embryos. Well, at embryos, Shane is like, ooh, me, 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 sign me up. Because embryos sounds like them fanciest ones, and we want those. Where the fuck did Shane grow up? Because we got to contact that school district, ASAP, and find out what kind of sex education their curriculum entails It needs some amendments, and Dr. Susie Q with the Sally Jesse glasses can certainly help. I mean, this doctor did not know what she was getting into. She thought med school was hard. Try getting through a conversation with Shane and Lacey. Which begs the question, has this woman met Lacey before? Like, has Lacey ever been to her for a normal visit? Because they had to have known that they were going to launch into the prison backstory. Like, production had to go in there and say, this couple is coming in. They're going to tell you something. Because that's not a normal conversation. Or I would certainly hope that Shane wouldn't sit down and just be like, we met when I was in prison. But Dr. Glasses, knowing that Lacey's a cam girl, like a normal doctor their client, their patient would know that, I would think. And that's not necessarily something that she should be ashamed of, but something that in terms of sexual health, maybe your doctor would or wouldn't need to know because I couldn't tell where their conversation was going. Did Dr. God, doesn't she just look like a Susie Q? Dr. Susie Q, did she know that they are not only married, but working together? I thought the doctor thought Shane was joking around, not that Lacey was his actual employer. I guess either way, she's traumatized from this meeting. So let's jump ahead to moving day where I felt personally victimized on this moving day. Shane has never moved before because, again, he's like a (laughs) Robin Williams in that movie, Jack. He's just like frozen at this age, 14. He's never moved, so he's just going to fuel up for the day. In what I've heard people say he was drinking vodka, I don't think so. I drink enough wine, enough cheap bargain wine, to know that was a barefoot Pinot Grigio, possibly a Moscato bottle, like one of those big three-in-one bottles, which is disgusting. Not because it's barefoot. I mean, barefoot wine, it's fine. But I mean, chugging wine from a tumbler, oh, I can feel the acidity in my stomach just creeping up into my esophagus right now. So mix Moscato and Shane together with a lazy ass Lacey just sitting there with her big old lips. Maybe that's too heavy for her to be moving around. That's why she's sitting on her ass all day. These two assholes think that the movers are also packers because that house is a damn mess. They are not ready to move. They probably hired these movers off a Craigslist because they're packing a U-Haul. It's not like a professional company. It's just like a recipe for a really good Judge Judy episode where like Lacey is being sued by the movers and the landlord because looking at that house, you know she's going to leave it disgusting because the house is a mess. When she sat down in her master bedroom, the carpet all around her, where her bed was, even under her bed, was disgusting. She called Jean, you know, in that scene where she calls Jean. All I could see, I wasn't even about Jean at that point. Look at, I'm like speechless at this point. I can't put my thoughts together. Fuck her and Jean. I don't even care. I care about how she's leaving that carpet. It was worse than hotel carpeting. Probably worse than airplane carpeting. Yeah, I said it. You want to think about what's dripping off that bed onto the carpet? Right. And then I saw like Arizona iced teas, sugar, and a berber like that. (laughs) Do you know what kind of mess, what kind of disaster that leaves? 
So the two of them are just milling around, not packing anything up as they pass it, not even taking the pictures off the wall. That's easy. Nope, they're doing nothing. Lacey's walking around in another way too small maxi dress, and Shane is the ultimate asshole following the movers around, standing behind them, talking to them about himself while they're trying to work. You either let the guys work or you get the fuck out of their way. Do something. Today, Junior, do something. Don't be that asshole. And I'm saying this to you. If you have people who are working in your house, well, first of all, make sure that you trust them so you don't have to follow them around. Let them do their job. Maybe poke in your head every once in a while. Give them a drink of water. Do not, by the way, don't make them a BLT sandwich. If you watch, wow, this is like real tangent here. If you watch the first 48 on A&E, you will have caught the latest episode where there was a guy doing, it was like tree trimming on some older couple's house. And the couple was super nice. It was like a Habitat for Humanity volunteer couple. And they were making the guy BLT sandwiches. And what does the guy do? He breaks into their house like two weeks later and kills them. So maybe don't be that nice. Don't make BLT sandwiches, but just don't follow them around. All right. There's a happy balance between being murdered and not being an asshole. If you don't watch the first 48 on A&E, you need to be watching it, especially if you like documentaries and true crime. So where was I? Oh, right. Okay. So Lacey calls John. No surprise because we know she's going to call him because she loves being fought over. And as much as she says, he's a friend of mine, I care about him. No, that's not why, because you don't smack a friend across the face multiple times like she did with John, with Jean. So Lacey can just fuck off with her big old lips. Worst lips I've seen since that Muppet that everyone compares her to. All right, so that does it for this week's episode. Remember, Patreon this week, Married at First Sight, me talking some 60 days in. Maybe I'll fill you in on the other episodes of The First 48 because there were some really good, uh, God, that sounds terrible, some really good murders. Ugh, terrible situations, but excellent documentary series. Total Request podcast this week. Amanda and I are going to be recapping an episode of Pen15. All of these links to Patreon, Total Request podcast are in the show notes. Remember, check out my sponsors this week, Ritual and Modern Fertility. And until next time, stay salty. Stay salty.